Every year, more than three billion air passengers head for the skies. The vast majority return safely to Earth without incident. But a small number experience life-changing moments they will never forget. It was like a war zone in the sky. We hear first-hand accounts from the passengers and pilots who have lived through the most shocking extremes of air travel. Went on the wildest teacup ride you could ever imagine. From great escapes... Run, run, it's gonna blow. ...to mad moments and highway robbery... This is now gonna cost you £24,000. ...to highway landings. Holy... It's definitely something I don't teach in driving school, so how to avoid a plane. In the age of the smartphone, these events are caught on camera as never before. Awesome. We reveal exclusive footage never seen on television. So keep your seatbelt fastened for the world's wildest flights. In this episode of World's Wildest Flights, the tactical military response to an airborne altercation. The SWAT team stormed the aircraft with machine guns drawn. I'm wondering what is going on. It's the it's us. It's the it's us. Terror over the Pacific Ocean. We saw a flash and heard a sound, and then the cabin started filling up with smoke. And the dream birthday gift that became a nightmare fledgling flight. This was my wife's first time in an airplane, and it crashed. December 2014, the Lake District, England. The Turner family are heading off for a trip to Las Vegas for a much needed break after a long illness. Their holiday from hell starts as it will continue. So we set off in the morning, everything was fine. You know, we're all looking forward to going, uh, very excited. Um, packed the car and, and, and set off. The whole journey down to Gatwick took us hours. We were in traffic jams. It was just bad from the offset, really. But after a restless night at a hotel near Gatwick, the family wake up raring to get the holiday started. So we got up in the morning, got on the shuttle bus, which took us into the terminal, and went through security fine, everything was fine, and went to the gate to board. The funny thing is, when we got on the plane, my eldest daughter was upset. And I'd actually said to one of the cabin crew, can you have a little chat with Kenya? She doesn't really like flying. And he came over to her and said, oh, don't get upset. Nothing ever happens on these flights. They're boring. Words that the attendant on board flight VS-43 would no doubt later regret. The problems start as soon as the plane leaves the tarmac. And every time you take off, you can always hear the wheels coming up after a certain length of time. They always make that, f that noise. But they started coming up and there was a huge bang, a huge bang. I turned around and I said to Stace, I said, yeah, I said, something's not right there. That was dead loud, that. The passengers have no idea of the danger they are in, but Stacey's dad, Norman, spots something worrying as he follows the plane's progress on an online flight tracker. I noticed it go over Cornwall into the Bristol, Bristol Channel. But then, for some unknown reason, the flight started to circle and circle and circle. That I couldn't really work it out. So I actually messaged Stace. I said, is there something wrong? He said, no, we don't think there's anything wrong. It's circling for some unknown reason. And, and this went on for quite a few minutes. High in the sky over the West Country, the pilot tells the 447 passengers that their holiday flight is being aborted. And he came over the tannoy and said, there's a problem with the hydraulics. We're going to go back to Gatwick. I texted my dad back and said, there's something wrong with the hydraulics. Um, but don't worry, we're going to land at Gatwick and then we'll be off again before we know it. He said not to worry. No, there was he no problem. He said, they're, they're going to fix it. They're going to fix it and we'll set off again. No issues. So we turned around, didn't we? We turned around. News of the ailing 747 spreads to aviation enthusiasts across the UK including geography teacher Jack Davison, who's tucked up in bed enjoying a lie-in during the Christmas holidays. My friend messaged me and said, I've been on the internet and there is uh, an aircraft with problems close to you. 
I very quickly got changed. I, I did I run to my car, it was a bit dramatic. I drove to the airport. I knew there was a footpath locally that probably overlooked the airport, should I find it. Um, I got there, quickly looked at an Ordnance Survey map, worked out where the footpath was and ran um, because he said it's imminent, it's coming in any minute. Thousands of feet above Jack, the pilot has started to eject fuel, ready for an emergency landing. We had seats just behind the wing, and sort of just looking out the window, and next thing you could see all the kerosene, all the jet fuel, you know, coming out the end of the, the wing. You cannot land the airplane at the same weight you took it off at. You must get rid of that gas. So if you're going to come back and land where you took off, you have to either dump it or burn it off. So that's, that's an absolute requirement. And also, without having fuel in your tanks, less probability of a fire breaking out as soon as you land. It didn't look good because you thought, oh, you know, we use that stuff to fly the plane with and it's all coming out the end <laughs> of the wings. Jack has arrived at the prime filming spot at the end of the Gatwick runway. As I was sort of coming across the field rather quickly and getting covered in mud, I heard a plane and I could just see that it was the plane in question. It was a Virgin Atlantic 747 and I assumed it was going to come and land and I wasn't really in a very good position to film it. So as it neared the airport, I got my camera out and attempted to film the aircraft landing. But to my relief, it didn't actually land. It was just in a low fly past of the airport. After getting this very shaky footage of the first flyover, Jack looks for somewhere to hold his camera steady. I do have a tripod, but in the rush, I had forgotten it. Behind me, we have the entire airport, and this trusty fence post is the one I use to stabilise my camera. I held the camera on really tightly onto a fence post, which was good, because in the end, the footage was quite still, really. There wasn't much shake to it. The pilot of the Virgin Airliner is still trying to assess the damage to his aircraft. They needed to see what the problem was, and so he would... Um go down into Gatwick because if he was going to land but then he would go back up again and he did that about three times so they could uh, take Photograph. some pictures or see what was happening. At some point um, there was sort of a Chinese whisper. The Chinese whispers came around saying that none of the wheels had come down or had gone up or something like that. At that time when we thought we had no wheels we thought well it, that, that was it, that was it. It's a terrifying wait for the 447 passengers circling over Gatwick as they prepare themselves for an emergency landing in a plane without wheels. February 2013, Utah, USA. Mother of one, Cara Fielding, is about to turn 21. Her parents have lined up a very special present, her first ever flight. Husband Jonathan will be videoing her birthday treat. He'll be making a souvenir of a day Cara will never, ever forget. My parents told me about the plans for this plane ride a few days before my birthday, and we waited till a clear day and then we went up. When Kara found out, she was really excited and, you know, a little nervous too. This is her first time in an airplane. Kara's first ever flight will take off from Logan Cash Airport at the base of the Bear River Mountains. So the day of the flight, it was a beautiful day, about 40s or 50s. We were really excited. We had our seven-month-old with us at the time. The original plan had been for the pilot, a friend of the family, to take Kara up alone in a small stunt plane. We went to the hangar where we were meeting my mom and dad and the pilot. And we got to the hangar and he said that the plane we were originally going to take up had been dinged in the process of moving planes around that morning and so for safety we would take the bigger one, which allowed more passengers to come up. I convinced my wife to take our seven-month-old boy uh, on, the, on the plane and I thought it'd be really fun, a really great experience for him. I thought, well, what if we get in a crash? I don't want to take my baby. What happens if we get in a crash? And then I also thought that statistically, airplanes are safer than cars, and so we should be fine. Cara puts aside her concerns and boards the Cessna, along with her mother, her husband, and her young son, for her first experience of air travel. When we first got in the plane, I didn't even know how to buckle my seatbelt. The pilot had to do that for me. 
So uh, the takeoff was fairly normal. We uh, taxied up to the end of the runway. Uh, there was a little bit of frost on the win windows. Uh, it was a little bit cold, but then we took off and everything was normal and fine. And as soon as we got in the air, it started turning and the, you know, the forces on your stomach make you feel a little bit queasy. I was so excited. So being up in an airplane was really interesting to see what your city looked like from a bird's eye view. After we'd been flying around for a little while, I suggested, hey, let's go over the mountains to the neighboring city. So we started to climb, and we were at the height of the mountains. And that's when the pilot came on over the intercom and said that uh, there was carburetor ice and that uh, there's a problem with the plane and that we need to find a place to land. There is a buildup of ice in the fuel induction system, which means the engine loses power. So we are over the top of the overpass, and we were just told that there's carburetor ice. So this is kind of exciting. When the pilot said that we needed to find a place to land, I know that he's a jokester. And so I thought it was just a good old, you know, old fashioned joke. According to the pilot, uh, the very first signs of struggle, he pulled the heat carb because he knows what, what it is and what's going on. Um, but then a big old chunk of ice got sucked in the engine and killed it. The single engine Cessna 175 no longer has enough uplift to remain airborne. So the very first thing that the pilot did was pull out his emergency book and went through kind of the procedures, making sure that you know, he was dotting all the I's, crossing all his T's. It wasn't until a few seconds later after he was going over some checklists and figuring things out that I asked him, are we really going to land out here? And he said, yes. And that's when I knew we were in trouble and that it wasn't a joke. But right now, I'm just making this video. I love my family. I know we're going to be just fine. I had no idea that Jonathan was videoing at the time. I'm not worried. I think we're going to be just fine. In the airplane, um, when I say, I think everything's going to be OK, I was kind of more talking to myself. We are going to have to make an emergency landing somewhere. And I was praying my heart out and hoping for the best, kind of anticipating the worst. Well, right now we're looking for a place to land. We were looking for a straightaway that didn't have power lines next to it, that didn't look busy. Um, but ultimately, roads were too short, um, or there were power lines right next to him, and he didn't feel safe uh, landing in those. Just uh, got a prayer in our heart, and I think we're going to be just fine. We picked a spot, and he said, all right, we're going to land in a field right here. He had done field landings in the past. I don't know about in the snow, but in the summer. And I felt he was in complete control, and I had 100% confidence and trust in him. All right, we're going to land the field right here. The snow was sparkling. I remember seeing the sun glinting off the snow back at our faces, and it was beautiful. And then I relaxed. I'm very casually filming with one hand and holding on to my son with the other. We touched down with our back wheels, but because of the snow, it immediately dug in. And we went tail over fin. It was really violent, really quick, and then it stopped. I was so nervous for the sake of my child that all I could think about while we were spinning was how am I going to get unbuckled? Is everybody OK? Yeah, I'm OK. I'm not big up. You're fine. After the plane settled, Really, I was just in a, in a daze of shock. I was just like, what just happened? This was not what I was expecting. Um, my wife immediately is, where's my baby? And I say, I've got him. I've got him in my hands. Where's my baby? I had him. He handed me the baby, and then he got out and picked up the phone. I've just survived a crash landing, and I'm still recording. I was so upset. I wanted to be comforted, and he was still taking a video. So after I gathered my wits and my stuff, I went over to my wife, and I jokingly asked her, so are you ever going to fly again? 
expecting her to say no. Kara, are you okay? Yeah. Are you gonna ever fly again? Yeah. She very cheerfully said, yeah, sure. And at that point, I, for some reason, just kind of started laughing. <laughs> I knew that we'd be fine. I just, Jonathan. I didn't expect that. Apparently that was a little too soon for my wife because she asked me to stop. All right, okay, okay. Kara's seven month old son is checked out by medics at the scene. They reassure her that he emerged from the horrifying crash landing unscathed. He really was kind of a miracle baby that uh, he was held in my arms and that he was okay. In fact, the pilot had brought the plane down in extreme conditions without any major injuries to his passengers. Here's the hero. The pilot is very experienced and he's been flying for decades. Given the situation and how little time we had to take an action, um, I think the outcome was the best that we could have hoped for. His plane, however, was a total write-off, and unfortunately, it was widely reported that his insurance had lapsed just hours earlier. The only tragedy in this whole event, unfortunately, was that the pilot lost his plane. Flight VS-43 from London to Las Vegas was aborted shortly after takeoff when its undercarriage mechanism failed. The Boeing 747 is now circling over Gatwick as technicians at the airport assess the scale of the damage. The plane did a very low pass over the airport, uh, at a slight tilt if I remember rightly, um, and I was later informed that this was so that they could inspect the undercarriage. The team on the ground realise one section of the landing gear has not lowered. The plane may have to land without the wheels beneath its right-hand wing. On board the plane are Stacy and Dean Turner with their three daughters, all anxiously waiting for news from the pilot. Then he actually came over the tannoy and said, right, we've lost the wheels on the right-hand side. Everybody thought that, you know, things could really go wrong and we might never get off this plane. So I sent my brother-in-law, Ben, uh, I sent him a text just saying, you know, tell everybody in the family that, that we love him very much if you don't see us again. Uh, you know, that, that, and then obviously that text went and then after that they stopped us from communicating. Ben gets in touch with his father, Norman, who has been anxiously following the flight path online. I got a very strange text off my son, Ben. He said, is there something wrong with the flight? And I said, yeah, there is a problem, but I don't really know what, but it must be on the news on the TV if there's a problem. So I actually put the news on at the time, and uh, there it was. There was a flight on the news, to my absolute horror. It was so hard to believe my daughter and, and Dean and the grandchildren were on that plane I was watching at the time. It was, it was unbelievable. As the news spreads, Jack's vantage point at the end of the runway is becoming increasingly busy. I was there for quite a substantial period of time, alone. And then I saw a man running across the field towards me, and I assumed it was security or police, perhaps, telling me to go away. Um, but it wasn't. It was a, it was a Daily Mirror uh, photographer with his big camera. And then someone else turned up with their camera, and then another man stood in the field with his camera, and then I looked behind me and there were vans everywhere. Uh, news camera vans, uh, media people, like getting up step ladders and things like that. Back on the plane, the Turner family are all coping with the stress in their own different ways. Because Maisie, our youngest, was asleep. Uh, Kenya, our eldest, was burying her head in the sand and watching films. And Ellie, the middle one, was convinced we were all gonna die. So she was really, really upset. She was hyperventilating as well. It was horrible. It was, you feel like you've put your children in this position, you're taking them on holiday, and you just look at them and think, what's, what's the outcome gonna be? You feel responsible, really, but also at the same time, you feel like you have to put on a brave face. Um, because if they see the parents scared, that's gonna make them even more scared. Yeah, it's not good looking back, is it? I can remember listening to this bit thinking, really? 
The captain speaks to Boeing and is advised that his only option is to fly the plane in a bouncing action in an effort to free the wheels so they will drop into place. You try to shake it off. You know, if something's not working, you shake in order to allow the gear to, to fall down. And that's usually how the system of the gear works. You know, it mechanically kind of falls down and then hooks into place. And that's what they were trying to do. It was one of the most horrific things I've ever experienced. He did it to a point where you thought the plane was going to turn upside down. There was a few shouts out then. And people screaming, weren't they? Yeah, that, that, was, that was really scary. You need people crying. People crying, yeah. And that didn't work either. And that was the point that he said, right, we've exhausted everything. Um, we're going to have to pre perform an emergency landing. And then they, That was it. That, you everybody knew you were just... In. There, there was no way out of it. It wasn't, it, it wasn't going to be a happy landing. September 2014, Los Angeles, USA. Artist Jason Luag is heading to Long Beach Airport for a flight to Texas. So I was going to Austin for a convention. Um, it was one of the first times I'd ever really sold my art um, anywhere. So I was really excited. He's flying with JetBlue. In fact, he's such a regular customer of the airline that he's earned enough loyalty points to bag this flight for free. So what happens usually when you find a Long Beach, like other small airports, is you just you get dropped off and you go through security. Probably had to wait probably like 20 minutes to get onto the plane. Jason is flying in an Airbus A320, one of the most popular jetliners of all time. Takeoff was normal. Nothing really um, stood out as being wrong. And then we turned around, and as we were like banking left, I saw out of the corner of my eye like a bright flash, and we heard it. That's when the engine um, exploded. The JetBlue plane's engine has suffered a catastrophic failure. Flight 1416 was climbing uh, through 9,000 feet when the right-hand engine suffered a fatigue fracture of the lug that holds the turbine blades in place and it released the two turbine blades into the engine. The pilots shut the engine down and levelled off at that altitude. The damaged V2527 engine is now on fire, producing a new peril for the 147 people on board. And then the cabin started filling up with smoke and uh, it started to smell. If I were to describe it, it would probably be like if your clutch burned out in your car. Just a weird, not normal, you know, out of the ordinary smell that you don't, don't, don't expect, like in a plane. Smoke is a significant danger to passengers because it typically contains a lot of toxic fumes. Smoke sweeps through the cabin. The passengers start to panic. The masks didn't come down. Um, a lot of people were getting a little bit worried as to why they weren't coming down, um, especially with the smoke filling the cabin. So the flight attendants came down the aisles and they manually had to drop the masks. As the attendants walk through the cabin releasing the masks, passengers start to turn on the crew. Some of the people were kind of rude to them because the masks didn't come down fast enough. Typically, if smoke is in the cabin, the instruction is not to deploy the oxygen masks because that could feed a fire. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a uh, right engine failure. I'm shutting down the engine. We're headed back to Long Beach at this time. Please stay in your seats and we'll uh, try and clear the cabin as well if we can. Thank you. The cabin crew correctly assessed that the fire was in the engine, not in the cabin, and they were concerned about the condition of the passengers inhaling these toxic fumes, so they lowered the masks manually. This is the cabin crew's job. You know, we just read the cars, they actually do it. The staff and crew of JetBlue were amazing. I don't think that they got enough credit for what they did. The flight attendants were calm, collected, and they took care of us. The passengers can now at least breathe easily, but they are still several thousand feet in the air with a failed engine. Well, I was thinking, like, OK, like emergency exit is over here. We're over water, I know that. So I was basically trying to prepare myself for anything that I could think of. We're for landing, we'll be underground momentarily. After they made the announcement that we were turning back, 
Uh, it got really quiet. We knew we were gonna go um, back to the airport and land, but you don't really know how the landing's gonna be. You know, you, don't, you can't really expect it to go well after what just happened. Virgin Atlantic Flight VS-43 is making its final approach to Gatwick Airport. 447 terrified passengers have been on the plane for nearly two hours as the jetliner circled over the south of England, emptying the fuel tanks and attempting to lower the undercarriage. The pilot has now exhausted all options for dropping the damaged landing gear, so he is about to attempt to bring down the 747 with one set of wheels jammed out of position. So they talked us through what would happen that um, as we were coming in, the pilot would shout, brace, brace, brace. And um, they showed us how to do the, the brace position. You will hear, this is an emergency evacuation. Evacu and that, to me, when I went numb, really, yeah. I, I lost all feeling. Counting down maybe it's the silent. end of your life, wasn't it? But you didn't, you just... It, you just kept looking at people. And, and everyone was looking at you and you were all thinking the same thing, but there was no... There was no, there was no one hysterical. There was, it was silent. Well, it was just it was pure odd. silence because no one knew what was. You're just waiting to see what was going to happen next. I can remember thinking, it can't be. And then they told us to get in the position. They shouted, brace, 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 really right. loudly over the tannoy. Jack is filming the emergency landing from a spot at the end of the runway. There was definitely an air of excitement, but as an aircraft neared the airport, it turned into worry and people were terrified as to what might happen. And when they were coming into land, oh, myself and my wife didn't say a word. We never spoke one word. We just sort of gritted, gritted our teeth like we were on the plane, like we were actually on the plane with them. And you're coming down, you could see the horizon coming down and down and down. You were getting really close. You could very clearly see that only three of the four sets of wheels were down. I was thinking, the weight of that thing, is it going to manage on three sets of wheels? And I really thought it wouldn't, to be honest. And then we hit. When the aircraft landed, bounced up in the air, and for a brief moment we thought, blimey, what, what's happening? and eventually it, it, it seemed like an, an eternity, but it was probably a second or two, the aircraft came back down onto the runway. We didn't seem to break for ages, so... Just running along, weren't as we? As when you're on a plane, usually you can feel the pressure of the plane The brakes breaking. coming on. You didn't get that, and I remember hearing someone actually sh shouting, stop, stop. Stop, stop. Because it did feel like you were just going to... Carry on. It felt like he'd come down, and we did the floor, and, the and nose we were just carrying on. The nose wasn't going down, it was as if he kept it up or something wasn't right. Well, he had no wheels, he had no brakes, did he, on one side, so he was having to do it very controlled. And I did think, we're not going to stop. Then suddenly it started to tilt, and it looked like the end of a wing was going to actually hit the runway, in, in which case we thought this could lead to quite a horrible situation, because we, fuel is stored in the wings of an aircraft but the wing missed the ground by about a metre and the plane stopped safely just short of the end of the runway. Ah, <sighs> that's it, they're safe now. That was, yeah, brilliant. Hero. Well, everybody started clapping and, and, and shouting. Crying yeah, and crying. hugging each other and they weren't even with each other, were they, no. some of them, and they were... It, oh, it was brilliant. It was just absolute relief. It was like watching a movie. It, it, uh, it was one of the strangest, most surreal things I've ever seen in my life, but... It all had a happy ending. In this particular case, they did a phenomenal job by, you know, keeping it level. And that's, that's the goal. That's what you're trying to do. The passengers on the 747 have been through a terrifying ordeal, but seven-year-old Maisie Turner slept through the whole thing. When we'd actually stopped and people had done the cheering and Maisie sat up and looked out the window and she could see all the bright lights. And she said, are we in Las Vegas, Mummy? And I said, no, we're back in Gatwick. The passengers disembarked from the plane more than an hour later. I took a picture of it as I was getting off and I stood back and I saw some people were taking pictures, so I got my phone and I took a picture. I remember thinking, did that really just happen? The flight is rescheduled for the next day, but the girls just don't feel up to it. 
I can't put them through this. It's going to be horrific because once they're there, they're not going to enjoy the holiday because they're going to have to get on a plane no, to come home. Going to come back. And it, it wasn't going to be good. It wasn't going to be fun. And so the best thing we could have done was just get in the car and come home, really, which we did the next day. We so, stayed over, um, had a breakfast and, and went home. Done another six hours travelling. July 2014, Toronto, Canada. Assistant head teacher Vincent Spadaro is heading off for a taste of summer sun in Central America. It was our vacation and a chance to go to a country I had never been to before. Uh, so it was intended to go see Panama for a holiday. For Ontario lawyer Phil Thompson, this journey is a mixture of business and pleasure. I was taking this flight because I own property in Panama and I had a meeting that afternoon with the Smithsonian Institute. The mood on the airplane at takeoff was jovial, it was happy, people were going on a vacation. The plane takes off as planned from Toronto Pearson Airport, but the problems start as soon as the crew move through the cabin with the drinks trolley. One particular passenger is not happy about the price of refreshments. Phil is sitting just four rows in front of him. I was listening to him order a pop from the from the stewardess. He was a little upset about the price of the pop. He was commenting that he didn't think it was fair to be charged three dollars for a can of coke. While Vincent is sitting three rows behind the unhappy Sunwing customer. I did overhear the flight crew member say to him, sir please calm down, please stop swearing, there are children on board the aircraft. The mood on board the 737 is becoming increasingly tense. Then the passenger starts complaining about his duty-free purchases. He said, I don't like that I had to pay tax on my cigarettes. Why do I have to do this if it's tax-free? And she tried to steer him back to the conversation by saying, you know, sir, I'm just handing out headsets here. I'm, I'm not concerned about what you bought in duty-free. And this is when he said, you know what? I just want to bomb Canada. I thought to myself, that's kind of a strange thing to say on a flight. Nowadays, you shouldn't really speak that way out loud. I was completely numb in shock. I could not believe, again, somebody in this day and age would be talking like this. And it was at that point that I looked at my friend, he looked at me, and we both realized something isn't right. The captain decides that this passenger represents a serious risk and opts to divert the flight. He said at times, uh, Aircraft receive threats, and the industry take this very seriously. As a result, the decision has been made to return to Toronto. Of course, the people were not very happy about that, but at the same time, you have to reflect and think that this is probably a good decision based on their experience and hopefully their expertise and their judgment. Toronto-based security expert John Thompson follows events on Flight 772 as they unfold. Well, the first responsibility of the pilot is the safety of the aircraft and everybody on it. So you can't expect them to go into the, the cabin and deal with an unruly passenger, especially if you consider things. You might have only two people on the aircraft who are qualified to fly it. And if they're both in a fight with somebody acting up, they've just endangered everyone else on the plane. That's their main responsibility. The plane has already reached American airspace by the time the pilot decides to return to base. The US authorities take no chances and scramble F-16 fighters to escort the jetliner back to Canada. You could see them outside the window, the left side of the plane, like out the right side of the plane. So we knew something was up. We were not aware that there was F-16s escorting the plane back to Canada out of US airspace. It would have been kind of neat to know that they were there, as it would have been pretty cool to see them. The fighter jets were a concern because, you know, they can shoot you down, you know, if, if they're given permission, it's a pretty serious situation. Well, remember, ever since the, the Lockerbie bombing in 1988, uh, we've learned that if an aircraft is destroyed in midair over a built-up area, over a town or a city, the loss of the aircraft can also cause a lot of casualties on the ground. So now, if an aircraft is hijacked over our airspace, there will be a fighter plane behind it. And if it starts to go someplace where it shouldn't, then we're in a position where we can make a decision about what to do about it. 
Following a bomb threat from a passenger, Sunwing Flight 772 is escorted by fighters out of US airspace, setting it on course for a full-scale military response at the airline's Ontario base. JetBlue Flight 1416 suffered a catastrophic failure to its right engine shortly after takeoff from Los Angeles. Toxic smoke swept through the cabin. After the crew lowered the oxygen masks, the passengers prepare themselves for an emergency landing. I think uh, the mood in the plane got a little bit more tense. Um, that's when I really started to hear the creaking of the engine, because it got pretty quiet. The pilot announces the final approach to Long Beach Airport. And then all of a sudden you just hear brace for impact. Brace. And then the flight attendants were just yelling brace, brace, brace. They tell you to put your head down and hold on to your ankles and your, everyone's heads are down. Just hold on to see what happens, you know? It was a good landing, you know? Like there was nothing wrong, like nothing out of the ordinary. Everybody had like a huge sigh of relief and applauded the pilot. Right. There was a lot of commotion from other passengers, um, but I was just happy to be back on the ground. Wait for instructions, take a seat. The crew told us to, to remain seated, uh, buckle your seatbelt, don't take anything out of the, um, the overhead compartments, you know, like we're still in a moving plane. But not everyone on board is minded to follow the cabin crew's instructions. Some of the passengers, once we landed, started to get a little anxious to get off the plane. And then that's when one person took it upon himself to open the emergency exit. Before the plane actually reaches the terminal, a passenger opens a door and triggers an emergency evacuation. Yeah, the guy kicking that kicked the door open was like right over here. Once the emergency doors got opened, the, um, the slide inflated and the, the pilot had to stop the plane. And that's when people started to freak out because they thought something was wrong when there was really nothing wrong. The people that I saw injured themselves were injured after exiting the plane because of um, the guy open, like, kicking the slide open. Once I got off the plane, I actually had, um, I had small shampoo bottles of alcohol, so I drank. I drank on the tarmac and then made some calls and then finally some buses came to take us back to the airport. The passengers are bussed back to the terminal where Jason faces a long wait. I was more angry than, than anything about the guy kicking the door open. Because of that, I spent the entire day at the airport. <laughs> I think I spent 11 hours at the airport because of him. But he has no reservations about climbing back on board the replacement flight to Texas. They say you're more likely to get struck by lightning twice than to crash in an airplane, right? So I, flying to me is still safe. My next flight to Austin was pretty much empty. There was about 10 of us on the plane, and we each all had our own row, and it was smooth sailing from there. It's far from smooth sailing on Sunwing Flight 772. After a disturbed passenger threatened to bomb Canada, the 737 has been escorted by F-16 fighters out of American airspace and back towards Toronto, where the plane had started its journey. The jetliner makes a shockingly abrupt landing at the Canadian airport. We came out of the sky like a manhole cover. We came down fast and we landed hard with a very fast braking. We were aware once we landed that we were not going to the terminal um, based upon what the captain said. We went off to a specific area on the tarmac. The plane sat on a remote runway some distance from the main terminal building. And the, the time frame was now an hour, hour and a half sitting on the tarmac with no information. And again, repeated messages, please don't get up, please don't go to the washroom, please remain in your seats. And it was simply a waiting game. I was expecting to see 
a couple of plain clothed police officers come on and escort the fellow off. Then a family sitting across from me that I had been talking to said, here comes the SWAT team. Yo, what is happening? They came on board and were screaming, hands up, heads down. Heads down, hands up, hands up, heads down, hands up. Most people took that pretty seriously. You know, they had guns and full equipment. They boarded the plane very aggressively, yelling, and I still feel to this point that the passenger, the scruntal passenger, was not even aware they were coming for him. Show me all your hands, hands up, hands up. Each of them were barking this instruction in unison, and so clearly we all did what we were told to do. Hands down. 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 You know, witnessing what I did, the SWAT team storming an aircraft with live ammunition, with machine guns drawn, I'm wondering, what is going on? How did we get from what appeared to be a minor disruptive upset to an aircraft being stormed by the SWAT team. Mom's gonna be tripping. They're trying to get everyone so that if they're not looking at the police, if their faces are down, uh, they're obviously not planning an attack. And if the hands are up so they can see them, they're not holding a weapon. And, and so that was their, their immediate desire to try and control the whole plane. But of course, when the police come in in that frame of mind, it, it's often a terrifying situation. Hands up! Hands down! Sam, don't get scared, Joe. Hands down! Especially for people who've never been in it before. And I can tell you from personal experience, having someone yelling at you with her holding it while holding a gun is a little unsettling. Head down! The SWAT team moved quickly to restrain the young passenger who spoke about bombing Canada. It only took a millisecond for him to realize that they were there for him. They had him up and out of his seat and cuffed before he knew what was going on. They grabbed him and threw him down and handcuffed him. And the rest of the SWAT team, you know, were all in their position in action if anything else was to occur. He was cooperating, he was sobbing, he was crying. He was saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry and he clearly was just as shocked as everyone else. In this day and age, there's a lot of threats going on and you just have to go with it and put the safety procedures um, you know, into the process. Today's you know, world is a different world than we all grew up in. I think the whole thing was out of proportion. I don't think we needed to have 16 fighter jets. I don't think we needed a SWAT team. The guy was having a temper tantrum. I'm sure every Canadian thinks that the prices of everything in Canada are too expensive. He just stepped over the line by saying about the plane blowing up. The police have to make sure that you know, they win every engagement, that they control every engagement. That's, that's the nature of the business. And when you come face to face with it, it can be quite unsettling. The authorities searched the plane, but no offensive weapons were discovered. The passenger was later revealed to have mental health issues. He entered into the legal system. It was deemed that he was mentally ill. As far as I know, that he's been getting the, uh, the treatment he needs and is more or less a, a stable and predictable member of society, but I don't think he'll be able to get on board an international flight anytime soon. And Panama-bound holidaymakers he had originally shared the flight with didn't get back on board very quickly either. It was going to be a long day. Our flight was supposed to land in Panama at noon. We never left Toronto again until, I think, shortly after 3 o'clock that afternoon. The second flight was, uh, frankly, another disaster. Flying south after a few hours, someone came on the public address system and asked if there were any doctors on board. It turns out there was a medical emergency. Flight 772 was diverted to Jamaica. The unfortunate Sunwing passengers eventually arrived in Panama about 15 hours late. Everyone understands there are delays, there may be issues and problems, but we could have flown to Europe and back how many times? Four, five times? The compensation from the aircraft, I believe, was a $100 certificate for your next journey. Hmm. Makes you wonder.